and welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Joe Weisenthal. And I'm Tracy Alloway. So, Tracy, we obviously, I think, have a sense of why Silicon Valley Bank failed. We just published a really good episode with Dan Davies, like sort of like talk about where things went wrong Mm -hmm. on the sort of deposit side and failing to balance assets and liabilities and the issues, strengths and weaknesses of the business model. But then the other question, there are many, many more questions beyond just like why they failed. Yes. I mean, some of the big ones that are emerging are where were the regulators, right? It, You know, people were already analyzing SVB's balance sheet, you know, certainly the week before it collapsed and for some time before that. And you could see these vulnerabilities when it comes to duration exposure. And again, that's something we talked about with Dan Davies. And then the other thing, I guess just in general is It's not like bank failures are that unusual over the course of history. So this is the first big one, I guess, since the 2008 financial crisis. And so it's obviously garnering a lot of attention. But we do have bank failures throughout history from time to time. And it kind of begs the question of, well, if we're going to keep having them in different ways, and if the government or the Federal Reserve are going to keep coming in and rescuing them in various ways. Should we maybe do something to the system to make it different? What were the failures? And can we at least, you know, we're always going to be fighting the last war cliche, obviously, but what does it tell us about weaknesses in the system? And there may be things that we could do. And of course, there's things that people are talking about on the sort of written law side, which is like, okay, maybe uh, we need more banks to have greater liquidity, ability to meet withdrawals, et cetera. I think Mm -hmm. uh, some of the smaller, more regional banks don't have as stringent requirements on that front as the really large banks. And then people are talking about supervision, and uh, I don't think supervision gets as much attention as the sort of written laws, but it's essentially, well, why did the supervisors, the bank regulators, allow the bank to like create this confluence of risks, this big, like sort of very specific mismatch between the nature of its assets, the nature of its deposit base that allowed it to unravel really quickly. Absolutely. And then, of course, with the Fed announcing this new facility, which is quite a dramatic one, you have a question of, okay, if we're just going to guarantee all the U.S. bank deposits out there, then should we maybe make a more fundamental change to the banking industry itself, right? And actually, Matt Klein um, over at the Overshoot, I think you tweeted this, but he had that great first line in his most recent newsletter about how basically banks are these private investment funds that are grafted on top of critical infrastructure. And that structure is designed to extract subsidies from the rest of society by basically threatening people with banking crises whenever one of them is allowed to fail. And we saw that last week, right? We saw a especially a bunch of VCs coming out and saying, if you don't rescue all the SVB depositors right now, this is going to happen to all the banks. And so you kick off that, you know, privatization of profits versus publicization of losses argument over and over and over again. No, that's been like really clear in this particular episode. Like there's something about this story really raises some like uncomfortable things because it's not coming in like a wholesale financial collapse that's related to the collapse of the economy like in 2008 or 2009 it's like it's this very specific industry that sort of Mm -hmm. got in trouble anyway we could go on and on but uh, i'm excited we do have the perfect uh, guest for (laughs) us to talk about the role of regulators the role of regulatory failure the role of the fed in all of this in the history of banking and how we got here we're going to be speaking to uh, Lev Menand. He is a professor at Columbia Law School, written a lot about the Fed and regulation. So, uh, Lev, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. So just, you know, very top line view. You know, what would you say was the main regulatory failure with uh, SIV, with uh, SVB? So can distinguish- SIV must be a Freudian. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. S- yeah. <laughs> we can distinguish between maybe regulation, bright line rules that yeah. are put down in advance and, and sort of supervision, Yes, uh, which is discretionary safety and soundness oversight by, by examiners and, 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 and federal, uh, federal regulators, federal officials. 
and b- both the sort of bright line rules and the, and the sort of supervision failed here. Yeah, there was an over reliance on the bright line rules and a failure to do the discretionary oversight, the safety and soundness oversight effectively. So on the bright line rules side, uh, SVB figured out a way to take uh, additional risk without holding additional capital because of what's called the risk weight capital rules. Treasury securities are risk weighted zero. That means that a bank has to hold zero equity against their treasury positions. And so SEB was able to go and buy a lot of long dated treasuries and actually build up quite a bit of interest rate risk without that being reflected in the capital that was required uh, of them under the under the bright line rules, under the under the regulatory framework. Now, we have a whole supervisory framework that's designed to deal with these sorts of holes in the rules. Everybody knows that the rules are insufficiently precise. And in fact, we didn't even have the rules until the 1980s in meaningful sense. We used to just do discretionary safety and soundness oversight. And so the real question here in some sense is, how come the supervisors didn't pick up on the fact Mm. that SVB had gamed the rules to take on a lot of interest rate risk without holding an adequate amount of capital against it? It's a pretty obvious maneuver. It's not nearly as complex as some of the maneuvers, the 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 gaming. And it's not the, novel. It's not novel. Yeah, this is an old move. It's not like they came up with something new. You would think any any seasoned supervisor looking at the balance sheet could pick up on this pretty quickly. So so what happened? I think is is exactly the right question to be asking. And uh, I think the answer requires maybe, and this is might just be my, my approach to these issues, 20, 30 years worth of history to understand. Because basically, I think contemporary supervision is broken in some sense. And this hmm. is a manifestation of that. Okay. Um, well, I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and bite and say, please, please give us the you know, 30 or 40 years of banking history building up to this. Yeah. So let me, I'll, I'll say why I think it's broken, and then I'll, I'll tell you how, we got, sure. how it got so broken. Sure. So it's broken because outside of the stress testing framework, which I think we should mm-hmm. definitely talk more about, supervisors primarily now focus on process and procedures. Our insight into what actually goes on in supervision is very limited, and that's because supervisory materials are all confidential and can't be disclosed by the bank and aren't disclosed by by the regulators and often never made public. So there's a lot of opacity into into what supervisors are actually doing, but it's, it's fairly obvious, and I'll go through a few examples, that what supervisors today tend to focus on is the process. And so they will look to see, does the bank have a good risk management process? Does it have the right board committees? Does it have the right management committees looking at its risk decisions? Are there three lines of defense? And if the supervisors see the requisite process, they are very reluctant to make judgments about the actual decisions that are coming out of that process. And so they don't want to impose, they are reluctant to impose their own view oh, that is excessive risk. That is too much interest rate risk, as opposed to, we like the procedures that you set up to manage interest rate risk. Just to be clear, though, they certainly could under current law. Like, they're oh, not, they're, they're allowed to say that. They're they, supposed to, okay. arguably. That's what current law is about. And the process <clears throat> approach being grafted onto this is, a, is an innovation. The purpose of safety and soundness law is really very much to address risk. And the process angle is born of the view that the best way to do that, the most efficient way to do that across a massive banking system is just to make sure that the procedures are good. If the procedures are good, this, the problem will sort of take care of itself. So as long as you see the bank kind of debating its risk exposure internally, which you know seems to have been the case at SVB, and I know I brought this up in the previous episode, but you know there were some internal documents which I've seen where they're talking about interest rate exposure and they're debating it, you know, with their asset liability committee and presumably with their risk specialists. But if they come to the conclusion that actually we're okay, the regulators are just going to look at that and take it on face value because the process is there and they assume that you know. The they bank is kind of doing. doing what it should be doing. Yeah, exactly. If you're not one of the big GSIBs, the global systemically important banks, and you're not in the stress testing regime, I think 
that is what tends to happen. It doesn't have to happen, as Joe said. There are certainly going to be examples where supervisors exercise some independent judgment, but there is right. a tendency still in the supervisory process to look at compliance with the rules, to check for processes, and if you see compliance with the rules and you see processes in place, to give the bank a, a, a clean bill of health, as it were. And so the question is, how did, how did we get to this place? Because actually, this was an innovation at, at one point. We used to do safety and soundness, substantive supervision, without much bright line rules at all. Hmm. Capital rules date only to the mid 80s. And this focus on process is really an innovation from the 1990s. And so it's part of uh, what I think is the toxic brew of regulatory supervisory policies that brought us the 2008 crisis. And we still sort of have supervision guided by this 90s uh, approach. And I think the SVB failure is one of several really significant examples of post-2008 supervisory failure, where the supervisors are still focused on process and too unwilling to make substantive judgments, reflecting the sort of approaches that were developed by primarily the Greenspan Fed, but also the Ludwig OCC in the 90s. Can you explain what it was or what happened in the 90s? Was it a directive that came down? What caused this philosophical shift or just maybe mechanical shift in the approach to supervisory? Let me start with the 80s, actually, just with the birth of the capital rules. So what's the baseline? So supervision, safety and sound of supervision dates all the way back to the 19th century. And so the way that the government's managed the incentive misalignment between bank shareholders and managers and bank depositors and the public has been through discretionary supervisory oversight, safety and soundness oversight. That's been the bywords of federal law since the 1930s. And the way that supervisors would do their job is they would make judgments about the riskiness of banks' assets and the riskiness of banks' leverage and the amount of capital. And uh, they would write letters and uh, they would uh, jawbone and they would take enforcement actions. They would issue cease and desist orders if they thought banks were undercapitalized or like in the case of Silicon Valley Bank, they would tell Silicon Valley Bank that it had to shorten its duration risk. That's mm. what supervisors would do. In the 80s, you have a moment that's quite similar to today in that the banking system business model comes under a lot of pressure for macroeconomic reasons. Inflation goes up and then interest rates go way up because of the Volcker shock. This causes the yield curve to change in a way that's very ugly for a bank because a bank's business is a positive net interest margin. You earn more on your assets than you pay on your liabilities and your liabilities are short duration. And so if interest rates go way up quickly, you can end up in a position where you are paying more on your liabilities than you are on your assets, which is which is going to run right through your capital. It's not a profitable business model. Right. This happened in the 80s, and a lot of banks became undercapitalized. And supervisors were swamped with cease and desist orders and supervisory directives to banks all over the place to raise more capital. Some banks sued. One bank was able to prevail in the Fifth Circuit, and Congress intervened and passed a new law authorizing uh, forward-looking ex-ante bright line capital rules for the first time and saying that capital judgments of supervisors can't be second-guessed by courts. And so in a sort of accidental way, you have the birth of capital regulation. Hmm. The supervisors hmm. are overwhelmed and there is there are lawsuits and you have Congress saying, actually, just write a rule that the, that the banks all have to comply with so that you don't have to get into litigation over whether this bank or that bank is undercapitalized. Fast forward a few years, you get these rules and you get you get Basel one. You get an effort to align these rules internationally and you get Alan Greenspan as Fed chair. Going into the 90s, the banking system starts to transform. You have the emergence of large complex banking institutions and you have a a lot of soul searching in in Washington and the Federal Reserve at the OCC about whether supervisors are really up to the task of assessing the risk taking of 
the, these new large complex financial institutions, these large complex banking organizations that we never had in this country before through the traditional means, or whether we should actually embrace these new rules that have developed up and rely primarily on the rules and shift supervisors to a task that they're that they're more capable of of performing. This is this is very self-conscious for the policymakers of the time. You can go back and read some of Alan Greenspan's speeches about the changes that he's making. And he basically thinks that, especially for large banks, supervisors are just not going to be able to do it the way they used to. What we need are capital rules that require shareholders to have enough skin in the game and then the shareholders will do it. Hmm. The shareholders were supervised banks. And so Alan Greenspan hmm. says it's not about needing net less regulation. It's about whether it should be public sector regulation or private sector regulation. And we need to reorient the banking system so that we have more private regulation. So that obviously goes terribly wrong. Um, in 2008. <laughs> uh, it's not funny, but this happens over and over and over, doesn't it? Go it, ahead. It does. And so by 2008, you have supervisors have more or less unilaterally disarmed. They have shifted to enforcing the capital rules. The banking agencies are relying almost entirely on the capital rules for making judgments about whether a bank has adequate capital for the risks that it's taking. And Instead, they are looking at processes, and there's a real theory behind this. The theory is, in order for market regulation to work, mm. private regulation to work, there has to be disclosure. And so a bank has to be transparent about the risks that it's taking. A bank can't be transparent about the risks that it's taking if it doesn't have processes to monitor and disclose those risks. And so the job for supervisors is to make sure banks are monitoring their risks and disclosing them to the shareholders so that the shareholders can discipline the banks. And by 2008, supervisors have stopped bringing cease and desist. There's no safety and soundness enforcement. Huh actions against any of the major banks, any of the major banks that take TARP for years running up to 2008. Because if they're in compliance with the rules and they're disclosing to the market, the judgment is that system is going to work. What goes wrong is that bank shareholders have an incentive to take much more risk than is in the interest of the government or depositors. It's sort of basic economic stuff. The shareholders have an incentive to extract wealth from the depositors and from the public. And so the shareholders are going to be much more comfortable with a lot more risk than the public should be. And so if you're going to rely on them to monitor risk taking, you're going to get a much riskier bank. And this is Silicon Valley Bank story. I mean, it's, it's very much Silicon Valley Bank story. So you get 2008 and you get a modification after 2008, which is stress tests. But a lot of ordinary day-to-day -day supervision continues to be, I think, procedurally oriented. And you see this with the London Whale, mm. and you see this with the fake account scandal at Wells Fargo, both of which I think are really important data points for outside observers to think about how much did we fix supervision after 2008? How much did we move away from the Greenspan 90s cocktail of bright line capital rules and procedural oversight oriented to shareholder discipline? And I think the answer is for the small banks that are not subject to stress tests, and even for the big banks that are subject to stress tests, um, outside of the stress testing regime, we still have a lot of procedural oversight. So this is actually a very quick mechanical question, but for a bank like Silicon Valley Bank, is it as supervisor? Is it a panel like how like what do you know do you have a sense of like how many people i mean because it's, it's somewhere at the sfn presumably and i assume there's thousands of banks in california probably or at least hundreds like what kind of just like human resources could even go currently to paying attention to silicon valley a bank like silicon valley bank so there are thousands of supervisors across the federal system okay they're split across three agencies, the Federal Reserve, the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, and the Comptroller of the Currency. They split up responsibility for supervising banks. Silicon Valley Bank is a state chartered bank, and it's a member of the Federal Reserve System. So as a result, as you say, it's the Fed that would have responsibility at the federal level for primary responsibility for supervision. If there's always overlap. So the FDIC has some ability mm -hmm. to, to come in because it's ensuring the deposits, obviously, and then it's very involved now. But the day-to-day -day job here is, is, is Fed personnel in, the, in San Francisco who are really actually exercising delegated authority of the Board of Governors, mm. which is the 
federal agency with the power to supervise member banks. Uh, and the Reserve Bank of San Francisco is actually a federal bank, a federal corporation. And so it's 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 facilitating, it's helping the board. And the board has supervisory staff that are supposed to sort of oversee what is going on at the Reserve Bank. So is San Francisco doing a good job? And obviously at the top of that is Michael Barr, the vice chair for supervision. I'm going to have some more questions on the San Francisco Fed and the FHLBs as well. But just going back to the evolution of bank capital rules. So one of the big things um, that happened, and you sort of outlined it in the lead up to the 2008 crisis, but like it definitely hardened after 2008, is this idea that banks should be holding more bonds in general, the safest bonds. So, you know, U.S. treasuries in the case of U.S. banks, maybe agency mortgage-backed securities that are implicitly guaranteed by the U.S. government, things like that for their regulatory capital and liquidity buffers. And it seems to me like that probably made a lot of sense in the low inflation environment of 2008. But now that you have the Fed raising rates, you have a lot of volatility, it seems like these bonds might not be, I don't think safe is the right word, but not as unproblematic as maybe we imagine them to once be. Could you talk a little bit more about basically how we built the modern banking system on top of a bedrock of bonds that are presumed to be somewhat stable in price? So I think that you're right to to sort of h- highlight the appeal of treasuries and agencies to both bankers and supervisors in the wake of 2008. Bank that loads up on treasuries, it, that's like, you know, very wholesome. It seems very <laughs> wholesome for, right. for a bank to do, right? The government likes that. The government is like banks that buy treasuries since the Civil War. And so it, it, it's going to cut against even the most ambitious and confident, you know, safety and soundness overseer. It's going to cut against their their impulses to to sort of fault a bank for loading up on treasuries. I mean, that's mm-hmm. that seems that seems that's a good thing, right? And so it's it it it. it it, that helps to explain part of what's happening here. Yeah. Um, and it's also true that banks do have the ability to weather, usually, a fair amount of interest rate losses on their assets. So many banks think of themselves as structurally hedged against interest rate increases because while their assets, if they have long assets, uh, like long dated treasuries, that's those are going to lose value when the interest interest rates rise. Their liabilities are deposits, and their deposits are sticky; they don't pass through, and so actually their deposit funding becomes much more valuable when interest rates rise. So, if in a zero interest rate environment, interest rates are zero, deposit rates are zero, deposits aren't that useful. You're getting a little benefit that you have deposit funding, but if interest rates go way up. You're not going to, if you're the bank, you're not actually going to be forced to raise your, you're extracting rents, right, from the deposit public, but you're not going to be forced to raise your deposit rates. And this is actually strengthening your yeah. business. And yeah. Silicon Valley Bank is going to think, yeah, okay, so we take some we take some hits on our long assets, but actually our net interest margin is going to, position right. is going to remain strong. Our deposits are going to be much more valuable. And we're just going to, we're going to work through a, you know, year to 18 month period and be totally fine. Right, which it seems like they was was sort of the assumption that they had. Like they knew that it wasn't great, and maybe even technical and solvent. But I mean, I think it was in this week one of Matt Levine's newsletters. He's like this was actually like a very profitable time for them. Like it did, it would have been fine if everyone stayed. And presumably their expectation was, well, we're just making a lot in income right now. So the fact that we took it a hit on the asset side is not really well. A they had problem. they had a specific estimate in one of those internal documents where they said we could we could. Could shorten duration, but that would mean an $18 million hit to our net interest margin in one year alone, going up to like $36 million over the next three years. So they knew 
that if if they reduce duration, they would be sacrificing earnings to some extent. Yeah, I mean, I think it's fair to say that in 2021, they were making huge profits because this strategy was really working. Interest rates w- went way up, and I think it would have impaired their profitability, but they were they weren't wrong to think that they were somewhat structurally hedged, even though they had no interest rate hedges or right. anything, by virtue of the fact that they would slowly be able to replace their treasuries with much higher yielding treasuries well, while being able to pay depositors very little. And we also, you know, we talked about this on a deposit betas on a recent episode with Joe Abate and why they're often low. And one of his points was like, well, you know, if you have a bank, you have a, an individual has an account at Chase or something like that. They're providing a lot of services along with that. People are not that inclined to move their checking account just because the interest rate doesn't bump up a little bit. And I imagine for Silicon Valley depositors, these companies, the whole story about Silicon Valley Bank was all of the products, the startup specific products that they are uh, that they offered, which presumably to their mind insulated them to some extent against losing deposits. Absolutely. And I mean, in, in the case of SVB, there was also what in antitrust law we call tying, where what a company ties one product to another product. Yeah. And so mm. the bank would require that if you wanted to borrow from the bank, that you would have your Is that unusual? Because people, some people, I've seen some people like, oh, that's weird. And some people's like, no, of course, like any commercial loan. But is that unusual in your view? I don't think it is unusual. Okay. There are strict rules about bank tying in other areas, but- my understanding is that banks are explicitly permitted to yeah. tie deposit account services to lending services. And historically, it was core to the banking business that you were the depository institution for the for your borrowers, right. that that went together. And you know we've moved away from that uh, technology. Lots of things have allowed people to borrow from banks that aren't the banks where they bank at. But w- a long time, the idea was that there's a lot of synergies between that. No one's going to be in a better position to determine how much to lend to you than your own banker. Right. I imagine like there was also a bit of a, a prestige element to banking at SVB as well, given that it, you know it was so popular among a particular type of tech slash VC person. But you know, Joe touched on the episode we did on deposit betas with Joe Abade. But Lev, I'd love to hear from you, like. Why didn't people pull more deposits from a bank that was essentially paying them nothing? Because to some extent, this is the big question. Like, why did SVB have so many deposits well into 2022, at which point we started to see some of the, I guess, most interest rate sensitive parts of the economy, i.e. the tech industry, lose a bunch of money and have to pull funds. But why, why were people accepting of that for so long? So we mentioned a couple of the sort of rational explanations that, you know, there's a strong brand, you want a bank there, you know, they're lending to you, they've required you to keep deposits there. But you can't discount the fact here that a, a big piece of this was a lack of sophisticated financial management on the part of startup companies that uh, maybe didn't have CFOs, didn't have mm-hmm. anybody on their teams with any experience in managing cash. They're focused on their their business. and. There, it's very hard to justify a $500 million bank account balance. And I think we have one example of that. Yeah. Uh, it just there's, there's no reason for that. That's, that's very bad management. Uh, no well-run, mature company would operate in that way. Among other things, you, you, you have the huge uninsured deposit risk that we, that we saw, but you're also just giving up lots of return. You could have that money invested in laddered treasury bills or something and be or earning- Or cheap bills that are paying 4% yeah, now. Significantly of, more yeah. money. So there's a huge amount of money that's just being left on the floor here. There, and it's, you know, it, doesn't, it doesn't really make sense. And so we, we have to understand that these, that these customers, despite having lots of money, are not actually very sophisticated. So I want to go back to the supervisory question and ask about it, kind of come at it from a different angle. You know, obviously the 2008-2009 crisis was very focused on the asset side of the business and were these really high quality assets. And then part of the reason a bunch of banks failed is because the assets like uh, weren't very good that they held. And as people have discussed with uh, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, 
a lot of the issues, yes, maybe they made a wrong bet on treasuries or they put too much, but is the flightiness of the deposits. Can you talk a little bit more? I know that uh, regulators do bucket deposits from the most sticky to the least sticky, but could you talk a little bit about like how good supervisory in a sort of like active pre-90s way might have approached the uniformity of SVB deposits and the risk of them all leaving at once. Yeah, I mean, I think that if you showed SVB's balance sheet to a supervisor brought up during the New Deal system, yeah. so let's say it's 1975, they would be horrified at <laughs> the enormous concentration of uninsured deposits controlled by a group of businesses uh, with uh, very similar risks to their business. And so all of your depositors and are going to run into that, And this is something that a New Deal era de supervisor would be familiar with from press experience. Well, this I is think, not novel. <laughs> I think it would have been, they would have been unfamiliar with it in the sense that it would have been so unusual back uh, then. Okay. Everyone would have looked at it and said, whoa, <laughs> this bank has a very unstable deposit base. It, it would not have been novel to view this with concern it would be it would be even more concerning because of how risky it would have been to operate a bank in this way at that point in time when when of course people still remembered the bank runs of the 30s much more than than they do than they do today and you know part of what went wrong at SVP is it's not just that they had 97% uh, or something in uninsured deposits but that all of their depositors were going to withdraw at the same time. And so this is sort of a classic issue in the banking business always is in what circumstances am I going to be subject to a deposit drain? You know, you get to model your deposits as sticky if you're a bank because over time for the banking system, the deposit base is always sort of growing. I mean, with the exception of over the last year where monetary policy is trying to shrink the money supply. But it, you know, over time, it's a constant growing base. And so deposits are really, in some sense, a very long duration asset. Except if you're the one bank that experiences a drain to the rest of the system where everyone withdraws from yeah. you. And so if your customers are all going to face hardship, your depositories are all going to face, depositors are all going to face hardship at the same, same time, you really can't treat yourself as structurally hedged. You're the opposite of structurally hedged. You're not, and that's what, that's what Silicon Valley Bank found out, is it thought that, oh, you know, when, when my assets lose value, my deposits will become more valuable. But actually, all their depositors started to draw down their accounts, and the opposite happened. And so, so mm -hmm. they were just very, very long, low interest rates, Silicon Valley. <laughs> right. Their whole business model was tied to low interest rates, I think in a, to an extent that they did not appreciate. Yeah. And to an extent, supervisors clearly didn't appreciate, but maybe weren't even thinking as hard about as they might have in an earlier period where they were more empowered to make those sorts of judgments. Yeah, this is exactly what I said on our episode with Dan Davies. It was interest rate exposure kind of squared. But just on the deposit side, because to me, this is kind of the most novel or interesting thing about all of this, because we know that a lot of banks have unrealized losses on bonds. And, you know, to it seems like broadly they've been managing their interest rate risk so far. But with SVB, the big difference was that group of highly concentrated, extremely unreliable depositors who themselves had significant interest rate exposure and were pulling money over the past year. So what could regulation do on that front? So I, I guess instead of the asset side, looking more at the liability side. Yeah, so the the what 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 you want to see is a coherent asset liability management strategy for a bank. And so a bank that anticipates deposit drain, it's for a bank that has flighty deposits, and there are there are many banks that can fall into this category. And this is something that regulators and supervisors do think a lot about. If you're in that category, then you need to hold liquid assets that you can sell and that at their fair market value to cover the withdrawals. And so part of the problem here is that Silicon Valley Bank did not actually have available for sale securities at fair market value mm -hmm. sufficient to cover the withdrawals. And so the, 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 the fix for this would have been to have much less duration in in the in the in the asset portfolio, or many many more reserves. And this is the same problem, by the way, that took down Silvergate Bank and, to some extent, Signature Bank. They had deposit bases that were 
flighty that th their depositors suffered and their deposit and they the banks experienced deposit drains because they were concentrated in a group of people that were exposed to interest rate hiking. I just realized I promised to ask about discount lending and the FHLBs, the federal home loan banks. So, you know, in theory, when you have this type of banking crisis or, you know, some sort of liquidity issue with a financial institution, you would expect them to either go to the Fed, to the discount window. And for all bots listeners, we recorded an episode on this a month or two ago or they can borrow from the FHLBs. And some of the talk out there is that SVB got cut off by FHLB. Why would that have happened? And why wouldn't those two lenders of last resort do everything they can in order to step in and support the bank? Or is it the case that at some point, you know, maybe they're talking to the FDIC and they just say this is untenable and no matter how much money we provide, like the bank is not going to be able to get up and running again? So I'm speculating a bit here, and you might want to talk to the FHLB expert in the Legal Academy, Kate Judge, who's my colleague, mm. but the FHLBs are not a lender of last resort in the way that the FRBs are, right? The, the FHLBs, they, they, they do provide sort of lender of second to last mm -hmm. resort services yeah, to right. their members, but they are much more operated by their members and they pay dividends to their members than the FRBs. So the FRBs were set up in a similar model, but today basically function as public banks. So they have no interest in profits or anything like that. And they're willing to sort of take one for the team in a way that the FHLBs mm. are not. So I think it's a mistake to, to look at the FHLBs and say, oh, well, you really ought to have lent into an insolvent institution and took on that potential risk. The FRBs are, 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 are wary of that for, for, for various reasons we could get into, but the FHLBs have even more reason to, to, to sort of to pull back. We definitely yeah. have to do an FHLB episode at some point with K Judge because I don't know much about them at all. And we, we definitely, it's been too long, or it's uh, far too long without having- No one's had with, to think about them yeah, for many years. Yeah, without having her on. I want to ask another dimension, you know, um, people pointing to the 2018 law change to Dodd-Frank that seemed to exempt banks like Silicon Valley Bank from some of these uh, liquidity requirements that you were talking about, like, do you have enough liquid assets? A, could you sort of characterize the change that was made there? And B, had that not been in place, like, is that is that change that was made in 2018, does, does that tell the story of the demise? Had the old Dodd-Frank laws remained in place for a bank the size of Silicon Valley Bank, would they have been able to weather the storm? You can never know for sure, but right. I, I would suggest yes. Okay. Uh, that is decisive. And so this brings us back to how the government responded to the 2008 failure of supervision and regulation. And they responded with a set of tiered new requirements. And for the very biggest banks, you had the CCAR stress testing regime. And for all of the banks with more than $50 billion of assets, you had stress testing as well as collection of other enhanced prudential standards. And this new cocktail of regulation and supervision was geared towards preventing a repeat of something on the scale of 2008. And so we weren't going to impose this on the whole banking system, on all of the sort of smaller banks. But the thinking was, if we could just really get back to serious government oversight of, of banks over $50 billion, that would really go a long way towards preventing another, another calamity like, like 2008. And what happened was immediately there was litigation over the threshold for this for this new regulatory supervisory cocktail. And so this $50 billion threshold came under a lot of political pressure from the banking agencies and from various people in Washington. And the bank lobby fought a battle over many years to raise the threshold. One of the 
important figures lobbying for raising the threshold was the CEO of Silicon Valley Bank. <laughs> he was growing his bank and he did not want to grow his bank into additional regulatory and supervisory requirements. And in 2018, after winning over people in both parties to this cause of raising the threshold, Congress changed the law and the threshold moved up. Uh, a bunch of thresholds moved around, but the relevant threshold, I think, moved up to $250 billion. And the result was Silicon Valley Bank and its peers had successfully exempted themselves from the enhanced prudential standards that Congress had created after 2008. And the result was you didn't have the stress testing, which is the primary means by which supervisors now exercise substantive judgment about risks. And and so you had a much more, I think, light touch, process focused oversight that allowed rule compliant balance sheet configurations like SVBs to go relatively unchallenged. But if you had been in the in the in the enhanced prudential standards bucket, I think that they would have been challenged. They would have been challenged through all of these additional rules and also supervisory programs. And it's unlikely. You can never know, but it's unlikely that they could have taken so much duration risk and not raised capital earlier, been permitted to go for so long in a position where their liquidation value was possibly negative. Yeah. Since we're on the topic of the blame game, I mean, one of the things that you see people saying now is that, well... It's the Fed's fault. The Fed kept interest rates low for too long, and it basically forced people to assume additional duration risk in order to seek out yield. And I think, you know, financial repression is a real thing. But on the other hand, you cannot ignore the individual actions of one or a few specific banks, their managers, their shareholders, and their depositors. But how would you describe the overall monetary policy's role in the current predicament? So overall monetary policy is, of course, central to the current predicament, but there's a sort of false dichotomy underlying the view that somehow it's like monetary policy happening up here at the Fed that's then causing problems down here at the banking system. The whole thing is monetary policy. The whole reason we have banks is monetary policy. Banks are creating the money supply. Mm. And <laughs> the question is, how much money do we want to be created? So it would be the tail wagging the dog if we like had to change our judgment about how much money should be created because like somehow the system couldn't create that amount of money safely and stably. We have a broken system if it can't create the amount of money that the FOMC says is appropriate for macroeconomic conditions. And so I would not blame the FOMC for thinking that we need to adjust the amount of money that the, that the banking system and the financial system are creating. I would blame the banking and financial system and the banking and financial laws if they're incapable of producing the amount of money and changing the amount of money they're producing over time consistent with the FOMC's directives and the needs of the economy. That's a really big problem. And it does look like we're facing that problem now, where, where in the coming months, we could be in quite a predicament where the FOMC may make the judgment, uh, and we can bracket whether it would be the correct judgment, that the economy needs less money. And the banking system may be incapable of functioning properly under that directive. And that's the flip side of you, you know, the suggestion that the, the, the banking system should also be able to function under the judgment that interest rates should be zero and, and function in a way that is sustainable over time. And so to the extent that is what's going on, I think it's a real indictment, not of monetary policy, like the high level decision about how much money we need, but the structure being unable to follow through to execute on those decisions. Love Manon, that was an amazing answer. That was an amazing conversation. That was so helpful. So good. That was so helpful and so clear. I've said it every time we talk to you, I'm like, oh, I've finally had there's been a few more, but I so that was a that was very good. I'll just I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> I really uh I really appreciate that. So uh thank you so much for coming back on Outlaws. Thank you so much for having me back. Thanks, Love. Tracy, I love that whole conversation, starting from the very end, which I think is a really excellent way to sort of reconceptualize the monetary policy problem, which is that if the Fed is going to be tasked with like the sort of like big sweep 
macro management, right? Getting mm -hmm. employment, inflation at its targets, and so forth. In theory, we want to have a financial system that can operate under any, you know, operate relatively safely under whatever rates the Fed deems to be appropriate. Absolutely. I mean, I do think there is a fundamental tension between monetary policy, which, you know, like the big thing monetary policy does is basically impact the price of bonds and then having the financial system and banks specifically have to hold a bunch of bonds as part of their capital and liquidity mandates like that tension is there, but there are ways to manage it such that we can avoid failures and also provide for the effective implementation of monetary policy as a whole. The other thing that really struck me is this is kind of an incentives episode, right? And I thought Lev's point about basically outsourcing a lot of bank supervision to private shareholders and expecting them to, you know, maybe press the brakes on risk when things start to get out of hand. That was a really interesting one. And SVB, I think, is going to end up as a classic case where, you know, there was an acknowledgement that there was an issue here. There was the asset liability duration mismatch and there was too much exposure to long bonds and too much of an assumption that deposits would be around forever or that they might even, you know, return or start growing again. And it was a conscious decision to pick up net interest margin, or at least it looks like that. I'm sure more will come out over the course of all of this, but for now, it certainly seems like it was a decision to do that. And that that's really interesting. Like thinking about, like, it's, it's pretty fascinating that a lot of these like capital requirements and ratios and regulations that we think of as core to how we manage the banking system are all pretty young. And that for the most part, for a long time in history, it was like active supervisory, people making judgments based on the operations of the bank, whether their decisions on loans and deposits were healthy. But it does make total sense that it's sort of like, you know, I hate to use the words like neoliberal, but that like that the <laughs> role of supervisors would essentially transform to making sure that shareholders were getting adequate information, that you start with the assumption that the market is the best regulator. And then what is the role of the government? Well, and the role of the government in that point is to make sure that market regulators get good information. Like that seems like a very like big theme that like you could like characterize across a lot of different industries, a lot of different government. And then the failure of just like, well, the problem is like shareholders can lose everything and not be accountable for the spillover when the bank fails. And so, yeah, the need perhaps to get back to a type of supervisory that actually takes decisions into its own hands and rather than just outsourcing it. You know, I realized we didn't even get into Fed checking accounts, which yeah. is one of no, the, that's the next. Um, so then I think the next subjects. episode we yeah, have to do in this series is if all deposits post SVB are presumed to be insured, which almost seems like implicitly the case now. Why do we have private deposit taking private institutions? Anyway, so yeah. I kind of think that's the next one in this series to look at, well, what does this tell us now about even the point of private deposit taking institutions and should there be a public I mean, option? that is what I was kind of hinting at in the intro, but yeah. we'll just have to leave that yeah. as, um, you know, it, it was a trailer, not for this episode, but for the next one. Exactly. So plenty more to come, but shall we leave it there? Let's leave now? it there. This has been another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. You can follow me on Twitter at Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. You can follow me on Twitter at The Stalwart. Follow our guest Lev Menand on Twitter at Lev Menand. Follow our producers Carmen Rodriguez at Carmen Armin and Dash Bennett at Dashbot. Check out Bloomberg's podcasts under the handle at podcasts. And for more Odd Lots content, go to Bloomberg.com slash Odd Lots, where we post all the transcripts. Tracy and I have a blog and a weekly newsletter that comes out every Friday. Go there and sign up. Thanks for listening. 